This channel is part of the History Hit Network. For centuries, pilgrimage was one of the greatest adventures. Epic journeys around the country. You're going the wrong way. This is the pilgrim's way to Canterbury. And across the world. Are we retracing the steps of our ancestors? It's the spot where Jesus is said to have been born. Exploring the hidden. Some people might think this is quite macabre. And the darker side of pilgrimage. If something went wrong, it could lead to war. And discovering why so many modern pilgrims are taking to the road. Come on now, that was incredible! My journey has taken me from the north of England to Canterbury, then through France into northern Spain, across the Alps to Italy and on to the Eternal City, Rome! I'll now travel east into Turkey, across the Mediterranean, into the Holy Land, and on to my final destination, Jerusalem. It's a gobsmacker, it's a breathtaker away. -er. The third and final part of my journey begins at the gateway to the east, Istanbul. I'm coming into a city where for centuries history, religion and even geography have coexisted, mixed, melted together, sometimes collided. It's almost a bit of a cliché, but on this side is the west is Europe, is Christianity, and on that side is the East and is Islam. There are two main reasons why I'm here. The first is that Istanbul was a major staging point for pilgrims on their way to the Holy Land. But the second is that Istanbul was a major destination for pilgrimage in its own right. For nearly a thousand years, along with Rome and Jerusalem, Istanbul was one of the holiest cities in the entire Christian world. this city. Before the city was called Istanbul, it was Constantinople, and it was named after the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, who was a convert to Christianity, and he moved the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome east to here. So this wasn't some dusty, exotic outpost of Rome. This was the capital of the Roman Empire, the Christian Roman Empire. And it's here where, in many ways, the story of Christian pilgrimage begins. Not with Constantine, but with his mother. So this is Helena. And Helena is absolutely key to the story of pilgrimage. She was one of the very first Christian pilgrims. And she really helped to define pilgrimage as well. She went on a number of holy missions to the Holy Land, uh, sent there by her son. And she brought back any number of relics from there. She also helped to identify key religious sites. Um, at some point in Constantinople, there was said to be uh, hundreds of relics, including a piece of the true cross. So the cross on which Jesus was crucified, all sorts of souvenirs, if you like, but relics which had a holy power. And that drew hundreds of thousands of Christian pilgrims to Constantinople over the centuries that followed. Christian pilgrimage to Constantinople wasn't destined to last. Another religion swept through the Middle East. Constantinople 
Constantinople came under Islamic control in 1453, becoming part of the mighty Ottoman Empire. Many churches were destroyed, but one was so spectacular that rather than being torn down, it was converted into a mosque. It's called Hagia Sophia. I think it's one of the most magnificent buildings in the world. Hagia Sophia has a massive dome that seems to float high above the ground. Designed by two Greek scientists and employing craftsmen from across the known world, it was completed in 537 AD. For a thousand years, no other building had a floor space so vast under one roof. In today's money, it costs more than two billion pounds. And but it only took five years to build. Imagine the planning inquiry that would be needed today. It's a stirring sight, and housed here were some of the relics that Helena is said to have brought back from her travels, including the true cross and the crown of thorns. The building was an extraordinary destination for Christian travellers, unmatched almost anywhere in the world. So this is a magnificent and very detailed mosaic showing Jesus, Virgin Mary and St John the Baptist. It's a Christian mosaic, of course, but it wasn't destroyed when this building was turned into a mosque. It was hidden away, and now it's revealed, and I suppose it shows something of the complicated history of this building and also the city as well. Continually at the centre of a religious tug of war, today the Hagia Sophia is neither officially a mosque nor a church, but a museum. Meneer Aktegun has been bringing tour groups to Hagia Sophia for more than 30 years. Coming here now to a place of pilgrimage, the people I see here now in large numbers, I see them as tourists. I see them as pilgrims. Do you? Yes. Why? They look like tourists. Because we're all searching for something. And uh, I think that most people leaving this shrine, will they remember the columns? Will they remember anything about the architecture? Probably not. But they will remember how good they felt here. <laughs> They'll take away, I think, certainly a sense of an enormous, beautiful space. And peace in this space. Mm. And that's all, I think, what we're searching for, peace. It's a rock on which our future is built, perhaps. Fantastic. You like that? I didn't think of that. Oh, I, thank you. I it's just had that wonderful. thought. I offer that one up. <laughs> There's a great story, actually, about a pagan Ukrainian prince who was thinking of converting to either Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. And so he sent out his minions to investigate the religions further. And they came here to Istanbul on a sort of pilgrimage, I suppose, and they visited Hagia Sophia, and then they reported back that entering this building, they'd felt like they were in heaven. And so the prince converted to Christianity, so did Ukraine, and ultimately, apparently, so did Russia. Never underestimate the power of a building like this to inspire and evoke incredibly strong feelings. Once being a destination of Christian pilgrimage in its own right, Istanbul's location has meant that it's always been a major crossroads for European pilgrims heading east to the Holy Land in Jerusalem. It's still exotic here now, and of course it was exotic in the past as well. For medieval pilgrims, many leaving Europe for the first time, this must have felt like another world a mysterious land where people did things that seemed entirely ridiculous, like washing. I'm just a little bit apprehensive about this. Get yourself down, you see. 
Sanjat biraz burada. Ben geliyorum. Stop shouting. <laughs> in medieval Europe, public bathing and washing generally had gone into marked decline since the era of the Roman baths, partly because of Christian concerns or about public nudity. But then when the pilgrims started coming en masse through oh, Constantinople and the Near East. They rediscovered the joys of public bathing and reintroduced it to Europe. So in a sense, pilgrimage didn't just involve the spreading of religious ideas, but very practical ones as well. This is perhaps the closest I've come on my travels to a true act of penance. If it hurts, it must be good, right? Okay. On my journey so far, I'd seen how a desire to get closer to saints and holy artifacts created a network of pilgrimage sites. Places like Canterbury, Santiago in Spain, Rome, and even Istanbul. There's one destination above all others that for centuries has inspired pilgrims to venture on often distant and perilous journeys. It's where the story of Christianity began, the Holy Land. I've never been and I'm thrilled to be going. The place names are also familiar to me as uh, someone who was brought up as a Methodist. The Sea of Galilee, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Nazareth. I'm very excited to be heading in that direction, but also there's a degree of trepidation as well, of course, because that patch of land is still the most hotly contested on the planet. In the past, pilgrims leaving Istanbul for the Holy Land would most likely have traveled by boat across the Mediterranean. Today, a direct ferry isn't an option. So I took a flight to the Israeli city of Tel Aviv but I still wanted to get a sense of what our ancestors might have experienced when they arrived here. So here we are, this is it. <laughs> I'm not great at sea, so I don't find it hard to imagine the relief pilgrims would have felt in the past arriving here on a dirty, cramped boat and seeing the firm ground of the Holy Land for the first time. Over here is the modern, bustling city of Tel Aviv, but I'm heading over here to the ancient port city of Jaffa. That's where Jonah was supposed to have left when he went for his unfortunate encounter with a whale. This place has got serious history. British pilgrims first began arriving in the Holy Land in large numbers more than a thousand years ago. But this has rarely been an easy place to visit. From the 11th to the 13th centuries, Catholic Europe launched the Crusades to seize Christianity's holiest sites from Islamic control. Only the most adventurous of pilgrims would have stepped foot here back then. Fewer still came following the Reformation of the 16th century, after which the new Protestant church discouraged pilgrimage. In fact, it wasn't until the 1800s when the Victorian passion for travel and exploration reignited British interest in what was then called Palestine. Some pilgrims arriving here for the first time were a bit underwhelmed by what they found. One Victorian traveler writing in the 1860s thought that uh, Jaffa was rather disgusting and he wrote about how he saw cats and dogs lying dead on the streets and dung hills outside people's homes. The person who was largely responsible for getting <laughs> Brits back to the Holy Land was this man, Thomas Cook. Like many 
Victorians, he was a deeply devout religious Christian and he had a burning desire to come here to the Holy Land, which he eventually did. And the result was this book, Cook's Tourist Handbook to Palestine and Syria, published in 1876. There's a passage in the book that I think sums up the motivation for many Victorian pilgrims. It says, we still experience a sort of patriotism for Palestine and feel that the scenes enacted there were performed for the whole family of man. Narrow as are its boundaries, we have all a share in its possession. What a church is to a city, Palestine is to the world. Of course, the Holy Land has changed somewhat since Cook wrote his guidebook. Then it was part of the crumbling Islamic Ottoman Empire. Now it's an area carved up by religion and politics. Leaving Jaffa, I headed for the town of Bethlehem, which lies in the West Bank, a territory controlled by the Palestinian Authority. Now coming up to the Israeli checkpoint. Can't see any soldiers. Generally, so I've been told, they worry about you coming into Israel rather than leaving. I'm now in the West Bank. I'm in the West Bank. I think one of the hardest things now for a modern pilgrim to do would surely be to come here and ignore the political situation. Modern guidebooks do try to explain the history of the region. Some like to point out there was conflict here at the time of Christ as well. Around two and a half million people live in the West Bank. I met up with local guide Rafat Shamali, one of more than 200,000 Palestinian Christians living here. Hello there, Simon. Hi, Simon. Your first time in Bethlehem. First time. Oh my goodness. That's a wall in Bethlehem. We're talking of uh, more than 800 kilometers of length when it's finished. This is my first moment I've seen the wall, the famous barrier. Uh, it's bigger than uh, the wall of Berlin, by the way. I've just gone past some graffiti that said, make hummus, not walls. <laughs> the Israelis say they built the wall as a security barrier to prevent bombers entering Israel. It's come to symbolize the conflict which still divides the region, ruining lives on all sides. Goodness me. It's an image and a feeling that is completely at odds with everything I grew up understanding and believing about Bethlehem, about the popular image of this place, this little town, as the birthplace of Jesus Christ. Despite the very raw politics of the region, Close to two million Christian pilgrims are still drawn to Bethlehem each year to visit the site where the story of their faith began. It's the Church of the Nativity. <laughs> I can't quite believe it. The Church of the Nativity, I'm in Bethlehem. So this is the door of humility and um, it's a small, well, there's been several doors over the, I was gonna say over the years, but over the centuries, you can see the archway just here where the door used to be uh, much larger. Anyway, it's now tiny so that you can't ride in here on horseback and whoever you are, president, king or queen, you've got to duck when you go in.
A Christian church has stood here for almost 1,700 years. The original church, largely destroyed in a fire in the 6th century, was commissioned by Helena, the mother of the Emperor Constantine, over the site where Jesus was believed to have been born. There is, of course, some dispute over whether this was actually the site of his birth, as there is dispute over almost everything relating to the life and works of Jesus Christ. But nonetheless, this is where people say, think, and are brought to um, as his birth. And I feel it, actually. I'm really feeling it. Uh, maybe it's just the sense that this is where humanity has decided this is the spot. That's all that really matters, at least to me at the moment. In a crypt beneath the church is that spot. It marks a birth that is celebrated each year by an estimated 2.2 billion Christians around the world. This is the place where Jesus was born. This is where he lay in a manger. <laughs> I'm definitely touched by this in a way that I, as a, a non-religious person, didn't expect to be. I'm taking back to my childhood and to a time, a happy family time, of unwrapping presents and the Christmas tree and our own little nativity scene. So, there's a... My lip is... My jaw is wobbling away. I suppose this is as much about childhood and the innocence of it. My innocence, anyway. Don't cry, Simon. Cry, Simon. <laughs> Certainly feeling very, very emotional. Still, even at this point, I feel very British and don't want to push in. <laughs> This was one of the very first shrines built specifically for Christian pilgrimage. It's now part of a network of sites that inspire modern pilgrims to journey around the world. So we pray at the places where the heroes of our faith um, either were born or died or did something significant. I've never heard anybody describe it like that, the heroes of our faith. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Are you doing the religious equivalent of those Hollywood bus tours where they take you around and show you that's where Demi Moore lives or that's where Michael Jackson died. Is it, I'm not trying to dismiss it, but it, do you, is it similar to that, do you think? It's similar to that in a way where, sure, we're seeing these places where people live, but they don't change history. Whereas Jesus, he changed history. On my travels through the Holy Land, I was following Thomas Cook's 1876 guide. Like the pilgrims I'd just met, he was a man on a holy mission. And although over 12,000 Victorians signed up for his tour, he never made a profit. He believed it was his Christian duty to bring pilgrims to the land of the Bible. Heading out of Bethlehem, I ventured deeper into the West Bank. The desert. It crops up again and again in the Bible, both in the Old and the New Testament. Of course, this is where Jesus came to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. And it's a place where pilgrims have often been drawn to because they think it's a, a place where they can be closer to God. Thomas Cook brought his pilgrims out here, deep into the desert. They came to visit the 6th century Christian monastery of Mar Saba, where a community of monks live an isolated life of prayer and devotion in this bleak and forbidding landscape. The book has it beautifully here. The convent of Mar Saba is in the midst of grand and wild scenery, utterly barren and desolate. It is a lofty, gigantic structure built in terraces in 
a kind of amphitheater in the side of a mountain. Whether viewed from without or within, it's one of the most weird places in the world, and it's difficult to distinguish which is the natural rock and which the building upon it. Few modern visitors, let alone TV crews, are ever allowed inside the monastery. It's no surprise this place is so wary of outsiders. Over its 1,500-year history, it's been caught up in crusades and countless Persian raids. And yet somehow, it's managed to survive. Just seen inside uh, their first chapel here, which dates back more than 1,500 years. They weren't too, well, they didn't want us to film in there. They very rarely show visitors in there. But it's a, an extraordinary place. It's a cave but it's also a shrine, and in there there are dozens of skulls of priests and monks who were victims of the various invaders who've come through here over the years. Very moving, quite upsetting, actually, the power of faith, the power of religion, but a reminder, of course, for the monks who are here now of their part in the history of this extraordinary building. Today, there are 15 monks at Mar Saba. They live almost entirely off the land, with little contact from the outside world. Can you bring this food out for them? Oh, my goodness. It's nice. It's from our field. Mm -hmm. Organic, yes. That's very kind. You want? Yes. Thank you. Father Nicholas first came to the Holy Land as a pilgrim before he entered the Greek Orthodox Church. Do you feel very connected to that history, to those 1,500 years? We do feel, yes. We are connected. Even if we want it or not, we are. For many people, it's like a jail, but for us, it's like a paradise. It's something very strong. Is it the location that gives you a closer connection with God? Yes, or yes. is it the location and your relative isolation? The isolation helps because the, you have many things to, to deal with in the world, you know, and especially television and these things <laughs> mix you up. We live cluttered lives now. Yes, we cannot go left and right, so we go up. We meet the heaven. <laughs> He's calling the monks for evening prayer, which is also a sign that it's time for us to leave. Unlike other monasteries on my journey, Mar Saba doesn't offer accommodation for pilgrims. The same was true when Victorian travelers came here. With only two proper hotels in the Holy Land, both in Jerusalem. British visitors who came here during the 1800s often slept under canvas in a Bedouin-style campsite. This feels a bit, a bit touristy. Marhaba. Even out here, you can get a cell phone signal. Victorian pilgrims hardly went for the authentic experience either, preferring to take a little bit of Britain wherever they went. Here's a, um, a picture, a photograph of a long table set here with some rickety little stools next to it, but it's got a, a clean white tablecloth on and some silver candlestick holders. These tours weren't cheap they could cost 12,000 pounds in today's money, which is a lot now, but then given the average 
wage was next to nothing was a king's fortune. So when we look back on that time as being, as some people do, as being the sort of golden age of travel, when servants were plenty and there were distant lands to explore, it was only the very rich who could do it. Now, in my humble view, is the golden age of travel, when ordinary folk can travel around the world and have extraordinary experiences that our ancestors could only have dreamt of, unless they were rich, of course. Oh. That's not too bad. The pillow's a bit hard, it's like a rock. I've slept on worse. Oh, not the finest night's sleep. There were cats, there were dogs poking around, coming and having a sniff of me. I woke up at one point and there was a donkey coming into the tent. <laughs> ah! Thomas Cook's tours helped to pioneer modern tourism. And although his trips to the Holy Land were largely designed for pious Victorians, there are destinations within his guide that have little to do with conventional pilgrimage, like taking a dip in the Dead Sea. I've always wanted to do this. The sea is so salty that visitors can supposedly float under the blinding sun. Oh! They don't lie! So the book says, bathing in the Dead Sea. Every traveller should try the curious effect of bathing in the Dead Sea. Unless he is suffering from any abrasure of the skin, in which case he would suffer excruciating pain. Open wounds and salt water not really mixing. It's fascinating because what this says to me very clearly is that for Victorian pilgrims, just as with medieval pilgrims, for example, going on pilgrimage was not purely a religious act. It was not just for the pious. It was for those seeking adventure and experiences. It was during the Victorian era when the line between pilgrim and tourist really started to blur. Now, with cheap flights bringing millions to the Holy Land, some travellers who come here are shying away from crowded churches and shrines in search of more personal experiences they can have in the land of the Bible. I headed north to Galilee and Nazareth, My first stop in this region was the modern pilgrimage destination of Yardinip on the banks of the River Jordan. More than half a million pilgrims travel here each year to the spot where some believe Jesus came to be baptised. We uh, thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to be in the Jordan River. I baptize my sister in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of the Lord The modern-day John the Baptist here is Pastor Todd Horton. He can be called out at 20 minutes' notice to perform the ceremony. Good. Are you baptizing pilgrims here or tourists or a combination of the two? Uh, it depends. Like, I've got someone coming Wednesday, specific. He's like, I, I need to be immersed. But they come in all shades and colors. Some people didn't plan it, and they get here and they're like, listen, I need to be immersed. And have you come here to the Holy Land as a pilgrim or as a tourist? How do you define a tourist? Well, a tourist is someone who's touring, if you like, and travelling around. I mean, I've travelled in Asia as well, and I'd say that can be a pilgrimage too, just mm. taking time out to stop and reflect on the goodness of people, the wonder of nature, all of that. That's a pilgrimage. Well, it's up yeah. to, I suppose, it's up to the yeah, individual yeah. to define it. Now, what's a pilgrim? It's a person who's searching, searching for faith.
Just a few hundred yards from Yardinet, the River Jordan flows into the Sea of Galilee. It's beautiful. I'd just like to make a statement of the bleeding obvious now and again. There's a magnificent passage in the book here. Upon those waters he trod, those waves listened to his voice and obeyed. Everywhere the gospel is written upon this divinely illuminated page of nature, and the very air seems full of the echo of his words. It's poetry. They do not write guidebooks like this anymore. <laughs> As a devout Christian, Thomas Cook was passionate about this land and wanted his fellow Britons to re-engage with it. In the 150 years since he wrote his first guide, tourism and pilgrimage to the Holy Land has boomed. Here in the Galilee, Christians come to visit the place where Jesus preached and where four of his disciples are believed to have earned a living as fishermen. At dawn the next morning, I joined local fishermen, Israel and Amnon, as they went out to check their nets. See in the boy here. In a park ball, a chef's a havimota. Yo, in any fish, booby. Oh, 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 yeah, let him die. These gentlemen get very excited this, for people who fish all this, the time. This big fish, good eat. Good eat, okay. Yeah. What Israel and Amnon are really yeah. after are St. Peter's yeah. fish, good. a native species that would have been eaten by Christ and his disciples. So will tourists who are eating in a restaurant, will they, will they actually specifically order a St. Peter's fish because it's a biblical fish, because it's a fish that Jesus might have eaten? Can. Why? Can. Because it's the place, the place that he was in. It's the place that he was in, the place of Kinnere. And that's what he wants to feel. The number of pilgrims coming to the Holy Land is increasing, and demand for St. Peter's fish is at an all-time high. Here there are many fish. The fish is not local. It's a problem because it's difficult. It's hard to find the fish. It's here and there. There are many families. There are many families that are living here in the Kinneret. It's hard to find the fish in the fish. Most of the fish have gone. Why have most of the fish gone? Well, as they've said, too many fishermen, but also because so many people are coming here and they want to eat the way Jesus would have eaten. It's extraordinary, really. I think there's a, a profound shift here that I'm maybe noticing, which is that in the past, people would have come to the Holy Land to visit the holy sites. Now, they're almost trying to immerse themselves in the life of Jesus, the life of the Bible. They don't just want to pray, they want to have an experience. Just a short distance away in the town of Nazareth, some visitors to the Holy Land are taking that desire to immerse themselves in biblical life to the extreme. Hi. People like David Hull. David? It must be Simon. Simon. Right this way. David? Yeah. Why are you dressed like that? Uh, here at Nazareth Village, we uh, try to approximate as best as we can what it would be like to live in first century Nazareth. Uh, as far as what we wear, as far as the tasks that we do, everything is about being as close to the first century in the time of Jesus as possible. Why? My own path was very self-centered and uh, led me to uh, the point of death. I overdosed on drugs. I was actually dying in the hospital. Look at you now. Yeah. A little bit heavier, uh, a little bit healthier. It uh, led me from wearing pants to wearing a dress every day. It's kind, of, <laughs> it's kind of fantastic. Nazareth Village is surrounded by the hustle and bustle of the modern town. 
But here, David tends to sheep, goats and donkeys. The donkeys are out of control, mate. I definitely think it's your responsibility here yeah. to... Ah, they're just playing. They're two little boys. It does, for me, feel a little bit like I'm on a film set. Yeah. But I actually feel out of place. Well, you, what... So that, it must be working, then. Oh, that's fantastic. We can get you one of these if you'd like. You could do the rest. <laughs> With you walking around in some traditional garb. Just looking at Chris, the director. <laughs> he smiled all excitedly. <laughs> there are traditional first century buildings here too, complete with a carpenter's workshop. And is this, as far as is known, something that is vaguely historically accurate? Yeah, uh, everything here has been researched by a team of scholars and archaeologists. Visiting Nazareth village is a strange experience. At first, this feels like a historical theme park, until you realise that the main performers aren't all actors. You're Hannah the Weaver. I'm Hannah the Weaver. Well, it's very <laughs> nice to see you, Hannah. The village here. OK. This is pilgrimage as I've never seen it before. Goodness me. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> We're shearing a sheep. Shearing a sheep? Yeah. Uh, He's going to hold the legs. Yeah, come on. Am I? Yep. Shukran. David, what do you learn about biblical life from doing this? Uh, this teaches me that biblical life isn't pie in the sky, uh, that it's dirt and sweat and blood and that it isn't separate from real life. This feels absolutely surreal to me, but <laughs> timeless as well. You'll be glad to have it off. It's too hot to have all this. Lap, lap, lap. Ooh. It's all right, it's OK. I think, for me, this looks immersive and interesting and like an exciting experience for a time. I'm not sure how long I could yeah. keep it up. I think that's the point of pilgrimage, right? Because it means that all of life is an adventure. It means that there's uh, no final destination. It means that I get to grow and learn and shear sheep and chase donkeys and climb mountains and <laughs> explore rainforests <laughs> um, until the day that I die. Good luck on your travels, David. Thank you. Throughout my journey, I've seen Oops. how people's definition of pilgrimage can vary. For some, it's about connecting to Christianity through the natural landscape of the Bible. For others, it's about a connection with God through the small patches of ground where holy acts were performed. But there's one place that unites all Christians and has been a magnet for pilgrims from the very birth of the religion itself. And there it is, look. Oh my goodness. Jerusalem. I can't quite believe I'm here. This is a city the like of which does not exist anywhere else on planet Earth. A city that's holy for Christianity, but for Judaism and Islam as well. What must the travelers of our past have thought? They would have got here after long, difficult, dangerous journeys across the continent traveling thousands of miles by land and sea, and then finally to arrive. It's a gobsmacker, it's a breath taker away. -er. We simply don't know how many of our medieval ancestors made it all the way to the epicenter of Christian pilgrimage. But there are some clues to Jerusalem's popularity. In Chaucer's fictional account, The Canterbury Tales, written in the late 1300s, the lusty wife of Bath is described as having traveled here no less than three times. There's another book to show you here. This is the book of Marjorie Kemp. And Marjorie Kemp is an extraordinary woman 
who in the 1400s visited almost all of the major sites of Christian pilgrimage. In truth, I haven't really known where to tell you about her because she's been almost everywhere that I've been on these journeys, except she went in the 1400s, traveling around the world on pilgrimage. She had adventures 600 years ago that women today in many parts of the world would be unable to have. According to her own account, Marjorie Kemp was so filled with holy awe in Jerusalem that she kept falling to the ground in a series of dramatic fainting fits, accompanied by wild religious rants. Psychiatrist Dr Moshi Kalian believes that she may have been suffering from Jerusalem syndrome, a condition that he treats on a regular basis today. Many people consider Jerusalem uh, spiritually as the center of the world. They use Jerusalem as a stage where they perform their act. So these are people who are drawn magnetically almost to yes. Jerusalem. Yes, and more or less because they believe that this is the place where they should deliver their message to humanity. There are people now in the city Definitely. who think of themselves they as the come, new Messiah? They live in some hostel or in some hotel. If they have their means, sometimes they find some work to uh, uh, provide themselves and they're waiting for the day to come. What, so they'll be working in a shop or something, meanwhile telling could all be. their colleagues, by the way, yeah, I'm, could be. I'm the son of God. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. How many patients have you treated with Jerusalem syndrome? It's not a big number. I think it's uh, like sometimes between 20 to, uh, let's say, for the most, 50 people a year. Being a year? Yeah, being hospitalized. The 50, that's, up to, that's nearly one a week. Yeah. Yes. The power and pull of this city and this land cannot be underestimated. The experiences of Victorian pilgrims, thousands of whom came on Cook's tour, helped to revive and shape British interest in the Holy Land. And by the early 1900s, Britain had enormous power across this region. Everywhere you look in Jerusalem, there are signs of the British influence and legacy. Visits to the Holy Land encouraged senior figures in the British establishment, including Arthur Balfour, Edwardian Prime Minister and later Foreign Secretary, to support a religious movement called Christian Zionism. Followers believed in a biblical prophecy that if the Jewish people returned to the Holy Land, it would start a chain of events that would culminate in the second coming of the Messiah. Their beliefs, forged for many by pilgrimage to the Holy Land, led in part to the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration of 1917 gave official British approval for the creation of a homeland for the Jewish people. This was the result of pilgrimage at its most political, and it's left a lasting legacy to this day. The status of Jerusalem is at the heart of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But millions of Christians, Jews and Muslims still come here every year to worship in the holy sites of the old city. It's an area of just over a square mile that's one of the most contested and controlled patches of land on the planet. I was allowed to see inside the eyes of the city where I met up with British-born Israeli police spokesman, Superintendent Mickey Rosenfold. Wow. Here we so are. Mickey, this is, this is your, well, command centre then. Yep, and the most important aspect, as far as we're concerned, is making sure that the status quo is kept and is guarded in the best way possible with the eyes of the 320 cameras that are watching over and in around the old city. And here we have our coordinating officer, who, as you can see on the map over here, we can see the different cameras that are located in and around the old city. I mentioned 320 cameras. Each camera, Tashiri, are facing in different directions. So right. this is the church of the Sepulchre. As we see it on the map, 
So the holiest site the in holiest Christendom, site right. in the Christian religion. So we're now on camera 69, which we can see next to us on the larger screen. And this is in fact the Church of the Sepulchre entrance itself. Goodness me. And we can see exactly what is going on. We can now switch over to the Western Wall and the holiest site to the Jewish communities. And we can see it's relatively quiet at the moment. This is the holiest site. Holiest site. For Jews for the Jewish in the world. In the world where we're watching. Just a flick of a button, you go from one faith By the to the other. By the screen and also from where we are. We can now go from the men's section to the women's section and see how many women are praying what's going on at the Western Wall itself. This is live as it's taking place right now. And by the touch of a button, we can look at the third and most holiest site in the uh, Muslim world, the Temple Mount itself, and all the movements that are taking place. You have responsibility for protecting sites where if something went wrong, it could lead to, it could lead to war. It could lead to a major, major situation in the Middle East. We have to be very careful, especially with crowd control, and uh, making sure that everyone is on time for prayers, whether it's Christian or Muslim or, or Jewish. The prayers take place at specific times, and therefore we have to make sure that everyone is there on time. I've walked small sections along some of the holiest Christian pilgrimage trails in the world now, to Canterbury along the Pilgrim's Way, to Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain. But I'm now joining perhaps the holiest of them all. I was on my way to the start of the Via Dolorosa, the Way of Sorrow. It's the route that Jesus is said to have taken while carrying his cross through the city to the site of his crucifixion. Every Friday afternoon, Franciscan monks lead a procession along the 600-yard route. This is the second station of the cross, where Jesus received the cross, and then he began to walk, which I'm about to do. I won't be on my own. As we all made our way through the narrow streets, I kept catching glimpses of a man dressed in biblical robes. He's an American called James, who's been living in Jerusalem for the past six years. Forgive me for asking, yeah, yeah. but given what you're wearing, it's, mm -hmm. it's a, perhaps a natural question, but do, are you... Do you consider yourself um, a, a, a chosen person, or are you a, a person of, of ordinary faith, or are you a... Well, I don't think faith is ordinary. Prophet, or? <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I avoid exalted titles, because that's the assumption. Oh, he must think he is something, you know, something unique, special. You're not one of the people who... <clears throat> the Jerusalem the son of, yes. Uh, no, actually. No. Okay. <laughs> Walking the alleys of the Via Dolorosa is a strange experience. It's like a channel, continually streaming Christian pilgrims of every type and nationality to the heart of their faith. We are from Nigeria, but we live in London. Jesus, we love you. Are you having the experience you expected? Are you feeling oh, yeah, you're definitely. on the Via Della oh, Rosa? Yes, yeah. The spirit, the spirit of the Lord is here and we know we can feel it. Yeah, I feel my spirits lifted a bit by the, the joy of some of the pilgrims we've met. And although I don't know where on earth I'm going at this point, I'm enjoying it. And which way is it? I know a man who'll know. Just right up here. At the end of the Via Dolorosa is the main attraction. It's drawn pilgrims here from around the world. It's the place that has inspired countless Britons across the centuries to risk their lives on a perilous 2,000 mile journey.
And here it is, the culmination of every Christian pilgrimage to the Holy Land for hundreds of years. Medieval Britons in particular believed that in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the gap between heaven and earth was at its thinnest, a place of unlimited power where bodies could be healed and sins cleansed. This is everything we've heard about medieval pilgrims doing. People praying directly onto the stone where Jesus is said to have been laid after he was crucified. People rubbing their hands, their pits of cloth to gain holy power. Here, in the holiest site of Christianity, you see the final proof that we are just like our ancestors. It was here that the Roman Empress Helena claimed to have found the true cross and where she built a church to be a beacon of Christianity throughout the world. At the center of the church is Christianity's holiest of holies, the tomb where Jesus is said to have risen from the dead. I feel my hands, my nails gripping in. I feel quite tense being here. This is the holiest site in the holiest shrine in the whole of Christianity. This is the cave where Jesus was placed after his death on the cross. It's where he rose again and became Christ and Christianity was, was born. This is the birth of a culture, of a civilization. So many paintings, so much music, so much joy, so much suffering, so many wars so much of human history comes from here. It's utterly overwhelming. come to the end of my journey. It's been fascinating. I've learned so much about the value of pilgrimage for a believer, about the adventure, the excitement, the joy. But even for a non-believer, I think pilgrimage has so much going for it. It offers a very real sense of purpose and achievement. So go on, follow our ancestors to somewhere holy and learn about the history and the culture that shaped us. Or strike out on your own find your own Jerusalem.